Welcome to the third episode of the CDP4 video series, um, where I will show you how to create a new engineering model. So the first thing that we have to do, as ever, is connect to a CDP4 server. So I click on the connect button on the ribbon. I put the name of the server in and the username and password that everybody already knows. I click on OK and I open the session. So the next thing that I have to do is I have to go to the directory tab. Remember from the previous episodes that the directory is where we manage things that are uh, at the level of a server. So things like uh, users, uh, roles and permissions, but also models. So uh, in order to create a model, I have to open up the model browser. And this is basically a list where we show all the different engineering models that exist on this server. I then right mouse click, uh, click on create an engineering model setup. And then I get the uh, details uh, form to do that. So I have to give a short name and a name. So I'll just call this model demo and demonstration as a long name. And then what you can do when you create a new model um, is you can base it on an existing model. Uh, and what the CDP then does is it copies the model so that you don't have to recreate uh, models all the time, but that you can always start from um, basically a, a, a basic model. Um, and while I'm explaining this, uh, and here you can see that you can click any source model that you, that you have access to. While I'm explaining this, I can also explain to you that we have four different kinds of engineering models. We have a study model, which is a model where we do normal work when we collaborate together with the team. We have a template model, which is a model that is to serve as a template. So something that we would typically uh, copy to become a new model. Uh, then we also have a model catalog. That's an engineering model where we store reusable design patterns. Uh, and when we uh, start working with engineering models to create building blocks, that will become more clear. But in a model catalog, we store uh, typical building blocks, uh, the definition of what it means to be an equipment with all the parameters, um, but also actual uh, components that you might find on the web that you want to reuse. So a specific battery or a specific engine or a specific solar panel, etc. And then there's also a scratch model. This is a model that you would use for yourself. So not together with the team to try out things in CDP4 without disturbing the rest of the team. And what you can do between all those different models is copy from one model to the next to not have to manually redo work, but to benefit from the modeling that you've done in your source model and get that into your target model. But like I said before, uh, today I'm going to make a model that we can use as a team. So I'm going to make a study model. Now a model also has different phases. Uh, and these are the phases that you go through when you do a concurrent design study or a concurrent design activity. That would be the preparation phase, the design session phase, reporting phase, and then the last one is completed study. Um, and when you set this a study to completed study or a model to completed study means uh, you can no longer change anything uh, in that model. Um, the reason we have those different phases is that you can create a model, already assign participants to a model, but not everybody should already be able to access that model while you're preparing it with the core team. Now, when you go into the design session phase, that is the time when, let's say, the whole team should have access um, and collaborate together in the context of a concurrent design study on this model. So like I said, we'll stick with preparation phase. And then there's this idea of reference data libraries. A reference data library is a collection of data uh, that is reusable between different engineering models. So definitions of parameter types like mass, length, width, and height, uh, categories that you may want to use to label uh, different building blocks in a model so you can easily find them or add more semantics to them um, and also rules but those topics we will discuss in a later video um, there are more dom uh, let's see, tabs uh, here you have the active domain tab uh, and here you can decide which domains of expertise should be added to this model but that we can only do once a model has been created so i go back to the basic tab i've put all the uh, 
data in that is uh, necessary, I hit the OK button and then the server does work to create that engineering model. So one of the things that you have to know is when you are a user that creates a model, that user has to have a default domain, which is also the domain that is acted, added to this uh, engineering model upon creation. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work. And I will show you on the person's tab what that looks like. If I go and look at the details of this administrator user, here you can see that he has a default domain, which is system engineering. And this is then the domain that is added to a new model when we create it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add more domains. So I right mouse click on the model itself. I say edit, and then I can add a couple of domains. And for this demonstration, I'm just going to pick some uh, typical domains of expertise you need to design a spacecraft. Um, so I have uh, ALCS, communication. Um, well, we'll also want to know what the cost is like, uh, perhaps data handling, power, thermal, and mission analysis. So I think with those domains of expertise, we can already uh, do a lot. So once that is done, you see that they are added. And what I have to do now is I have to also update the participants. And a participant is a user that is allowed to work on this model with a certain role. So I go again and I look at this participant. And here we see that the administrator has the model administrator uh, role. Uh, and when I explain more about roles and permissions, you'll see what that means. But in principle, that means that this user is allowed to do everything with this model, but only in the context of this model. So you see that you can uh, have a very fine-tuned permission set also per model. So it doesn't mean that if somebody is allowed to edit requirements in model A, then he's also necessarily allowed to do that in model B. So you can uh, nicely organize the different permissions uh, also per model. And what you do here is you can, on this uh, edit participant tab, you can also say, uh, what domain of expertise this uh, participant is allowed to represent. So when we first created the model, the administrator was only allowed to represent system engineering, but now I've uh, selected all, which means that when I log in later to this model, I can do this on behalf of all of these domains of expertise. And when I log in as thermal, everything that I do on the model is on behalf of thermal, which means if I add a building block, it will be owned by thermal. Um, I hit OK, and then uh, let's say the participant is updated, and then you see here that on the demonstration model, you see that this view has been updated to show all the short names of the uh, domains of expertise that this participant so, uh, represents in that model. So now that that is done, I don't need these windows anymore, and we can go to open this model. So I went to the Home tab, I clicked on the Open button, I go to demo and then I say select iteration. And when I do that, I see that there's one iteration present. It's the active one. And here I can select what domain of expertise I want to represent when I open this model. I'm going to stick with system engineering and then I click select and the model is now open. You see that on the model tab, these buttons have become active. So now I can actually interact with the model. Um, but how that works, I will show in the next video. Thank you for watching.